All right, well, I also decided to, um, after I made the first video on this product, I decided to try my hand at scoping out the uh, voltage boost circuit, which increases whatever the battery voltage is or the auxiliary supply voltage is, and boosts it up to somewhere between 46 and 48 volts, approximately. So I mapped out the components in that area of the circuit board. There were several components down in this area that didn't seem to have enough connections made to them to do anything. It's possible I missed a connection, but I don't think anything here dramatically changes what I'm going to describe. For example, there's a, a twin diode here uh, identified as D9, but it's a three terminal device. And a resistor, which has pads but no resistor there. Another place where there's a, a location for a resistor but nothing installed. And one side of it goes to ground, the other side goes to one side of the uh, not present resistor, and the other foil goes there. And it doesn't seem like they go anywhere else, so I'm not sure why anybody in bothered to install that component here. And likewise, um, along with this capacitor here, which holds the charge from the, the boost converter before it's used by the pull-up resistors for the phantom supply, um, there is a small capacitor paralleled with this, but then there's also a small inductor, which goes through that resistor and then back to there what's it doing you know it, it looks like it's shorted out um, I probed from both sides of these to all over on the circuit board and couldn't find any place with continuity so I'm guessing that if there were more components installed in some of the empty spaces maybe these would do something but as it is I'm not sure this L2 and R20 really do anything. Maybe mistaken on that. Anyway, drawing it out in schematic form, this is the power switch. I talked about everything coming into the power switch from the other side, the battery supply and its transistor conditioning circuit, which can disconnect the battery if the aux connector is being used to apply power and then of course the aux connector diode bridge and some other things and you end up coming into this uh, c9 470 microfarad cap and i'm pretty sure that this is in fact a nash or a texas instruments lmr 62014 uh, boost converter in their simple switcher line and this part of the circuit is pretty close to what's shown in the data sheets for that part so it's almost right out of the right out of the data sheet um, filter cap here a couple of smaller filter caps I don't know the values they were not printed on the capacitors they're tiny surface mount parts I imagine they may be in the picofarad range um, and then a resistor pull up to the shutdown pin as long as it's pulled up then it's not shut down but if it goes low towards ground then it does shut down or prevent operation of the simple switcher I see and I'd looked before and seen that the power LED which is underneath the power switch plunger and via the light pipe functionality of the uh, actual button illuminates the button instead of being a separate LED that's visible from the outside and I didn't see a resistor near it wondered where the current limiting resistor was turns out they're pressing this pull-up resistor into double duty so normally the uh, power coming in here goes through the current limiting resistor through the LED and indicates that you've got a power source battery or auxiliary power source and the power switch is closed um, that will turn the LED on it does not indicate that the high voltage section for the phantom power is actually working 
I think if it had been my design, I probably would have had the uh, LED tapped off of here in some way that unless you got satisfactorily high voltages there, you wouldn't get the LED, but you can't have everything, right? There's also a capacitor from the shutdown pin to ground, so when you first turn power on, that's going to act like a momentary short, and it will prevent the simple switcher from turning on. It's sort of a soft start, or not a soft start, but uh, when you first energize the circuit, it'll prevent the, the simple switcher IC from doing anything for just, you know, a split second, I think. I didn't check the timing values, but... So, that's what's going on there. Uh, the ground pin is just tied to ground. Uh, there's a uh, 10 microhenry inductor from the V in to the switch output. Exactly off the data sheet, same uh, inductor value and everything. And uh, <clears throat> way over at the output, or near the output, these are the four resistors that get that apply the phantom power to the the four different uh, balanced line signals passing through the device and there's a inductor capacitor filter here a um, hundred microfarad in parallel with a smaller value capacitor and then fed through an inductor so that's just a little extra noise removal and filtering uh, but up to that point we have a voltage divider that feeds back into the feedback pin. In that sense this is still like the uh, data sheet but this is only designed to provide up to 20 volts output and we need 46 so how does that done? Well again in the data sheet you've got this inductor coming into the switching output and then there's a shot key diode going into what would normally be either an electrolytic capacitor, a low ESR electrolytic capacitor, or uh, some other kind that would work well for the high switching frequencies. Uh, but in this case it's just a little, I think a ceramic capacitor. So it's not the main storage capacitor. So if this were a storage capacitor, uh, you know, a bigger value, then this would be right out of the data sheet and if you had the resistor voltage divider here tied over here but what ART has done with their design is they've added an additional 10 microhenry inductor coming out of the shot key diode then through another shot key diode and then with a uh, relatively small capacitor to ground and with another small capacitor going back around to the switching uh, output of the IC. I haven't spent a lot of time analyzing this, but it looks to me like it's sort of a voltage doubler, booster kind of thing. Um, usually when you see a switching supply or something that's operating at a uh, recurring signal, you know, at some frequency, usually a fairly high frequency, and you start stacking things up like that, inductor, diode, inductor, diode, each with a capacitor hanging off the diode. It's like the same pattern over and over. And I think that's just there to boost up the voltage, but I'm not going to go into an analysis any deeper than that. But I think that's the, the trick, if you want to call it a trick, that they're using to make this device generate uh, the 46 to 48 volts. And no doubt these resistor values are adjusted so that the switcher thinks it's working in a, you know, up to 20 volt range. But in reality, it's going to change its operation until you get, you know, 46 to 48 volts over here. Um, there is a small refinement here, I, unless I trace things out wrong, but I'm pretty sure I got it right the 10 meg resistor at the top of the resistor divider is paralleled by a lower value resistor through a capacitor and I don't offhand know why that is but I'm sure it was something they figured out as they developed the circuit needed to be done to make it work nicely 
and uh, ultimately you end up with you know a jittery voltage out here by passing it through the inductor and then into an electrolytic capacitor bypassed with a smaller value capacitor you clean that up and make it a nice steady uh, signal so my initial impressions of what was going on here are correct and fleshing it out a little bit just uh, reinforces that okay this is the battery holder that ART chose to put in this product the Phantom 2 Pro dual channel uh, Phantom power supply uh, if you watch that video you know that a 9 volt battery goes in through a hatch in the front panel and then it's just sitting on top of the circuit board surrounded by components and it almost seemed like an afterthought that oh gee what are we going to do the battery's going to be rattling around loose in there breaking stuff or shorting things out whatever and it's like sort of a last minute bodge is the way this seems to me it doesn't look like serious consideration was given to it from the get-go it's just very thin cardboard not even as thick as you'd get off the back of a you know like a tablet of paper it's about half that thick and it's just folded into a four-sided box and held together with um, cellophane tape which you know isn't going to last that long this product will presumably be around and in use for years after that cellophane tape lets loose and then this will cease to be a thing now because it's just a simple box like this it needs this side of it's up against the inside of the extruded chassis so it it can't go left so fine with that and then there's this glued on foam pad it's like a neoprene foam or something of that ilk and that I think is set up to go up against the first XLR connector so sideways this is wedged between the inside of the chassis extrusion and uh, a major connector um, so it can't go sideways and it can't go forward because it will hit the inside of the panel uh, and then the again it's sitting on the circuit board on the bottom and to keep it from going up there's another uh, neoprene foam pad stuck on here and that hits the top of the uh, inside of the uh, extruded chassis or extruded case so it can't go up or down can't go sideways can't go forward but it can go backwards there's nothing really stopping going backwards and there's about this much room between there and my finger of empty space except for some little tiny surface mount components that are mounted here and you might figure that well you know those things are so flat that uh, they're not that much taller than this piece of cardboard really they're very close to the circuit board and maybe the rationale is that if a battery's in there and slides out it's just going to slide over the top of those components but it's going to be partially resting on them and they're very they're not very strong components those little surface mount parts and the battery could slam back and forth um, between going in that way as much as it can coming way out here and hitting the back of the auxiliary power jack which is about here that's the only thing keeping it back and then you think well why didn't they just stick a big piece of foam here well the battery cable has to come around here and then go through and then extend out the front so you can connect the battery out here outside the case and then stuff it inside this holder the um, reason I believe this is an afterthought is that the connector for the battery cable is way up like right about where the tip of my finger is on the circuit board and uh, I don't think they would have put it there you know they would have put it back here um, because in order to get the battery cable out when you've got this in there it's got to come in from the back and then come out and come out through the trap door in the front and be out here where you can get at it to connect and disconnect the battery 
but then the cord has to come all the way back around and go to where they originally decided it was going to go. I think the first concept may well have been that you know you've got the cutout on the chassis right here and the cable would just come right out the opening you know this isn't even there and just hang out and then they say oh gee we need to do something let's bodge up a, a holder well there's no getting around the fact that you need a holder with this thing um, the whole design requires it now it's just that this thing here left me feeling unhappy inside it's just you know in some ways it's sort of clever how much functionality they were able to get out of just a couple simple things but I don't think it'll stand the test of time um, I know a number of other people are unhappy with it based on product reviews I've read uh, so I'm gonna try to do something you know now that we're stuck in this situation I'm gonna try to come up with my own battery holder which addresses a number of the limitations of this um, fits better doesn't have the the fragile design, something a little stronger, uh, something that uh, prevents the battery from sliding back into you know places where it could do some damage or get in trouble over here. And that's what this video is primarily about. All right, the first step is trying to come up with a fairly simple shape. Um, because of overhang issues. Um, I'm kind of inclined to make this in two pieces, one with the body and then one with the back. Um, we'll see. Started by making a uh, box shape with the um, orientation, the front of the holder facing towards me, and um, it's uh, 33 millimeters tall on the outside and 52 inches deep and 20 or 52 millimeters deep and 21 millimeters wide. Made another box here which I'm going to change to the inner dimensions of the holder. All right, I have the uh, hole, the box-shaped hole with the appropriate inner dimensions. And now I have to align them, and this is the part I'm not sure I know how to do. Um, I definitely want it front aligned, and I want it uh, center aligned from left to right, but I do not want it vertically aligned. That's the thing I'm not sure. I'll have to figure out if Tinkercad will let me do this probably there's a way to do it I have my um, hole aligned left to right and aligned to the front as we can see if I roll this around it's aligned to the front but I need to get this raised up and it's not just aligned to center, aligned to top, aligned to bottom. It's got to be dimensioned somehow. That's what I need to figure out. All right, after watching an instructional video, when I have the object selected as I do here, and um, I'm pretty sure that it is the hull because the handles down here are inboard of the red object or the red box. There's this little up-pointing arrow. That's because everything's presumed in Tinkercad to rest on the Z-axis at zero, which means it's sitting on this grid here. If I want to raise it up, apparently you just grab this thing. Or I guess um, a number will appear there. Let's see. Nope, that wasn't it. Undo. Grab that. And now, okay, 
Now the number at the upper part will say how far it's traveled vertically and the number to the right will say the same thing but the one on the left is just per this particular trip. And I only want to go up um, one millimeter. Bink. I just raised it one millimeter. That was easy. Alright, I've made another um, hollow box here which is for the uh, notch that needs to be taken out of the top, the thick top. And this is the thick top here. So, um, I need to drag that up. Oops. That's not what I wanted to do at all. I keep resizing the damn thing. Okay, I've grouped this box and its cutout so that I can treat them as one object and see more clearly that it's the shape I want. And I still have this cutout here, this hollow, this hole, and um, if I just try to drag it up to here, it will resize because um, you can't just drag things off of the, the, the workspace, whatever you call it, the, the grid. It needs to be raised vertically. Now the total height of this thing is 33 millimeters. So I need to take this thing and... Oops. I'm just going to drag a box to select them both and I'm going to do an align um, let's see will it let me do a vertical alignment well let's do a left alignment first okay that's left aligned and let's do a front alignment so it's down there now but now I have to drag this thing up um, it's two millimeters tall and the overall box is 33 millimeters high so I need to go up uh, 31 millimeters. Like that. And that's because of the roll-off. The top of this is going to be up against the top of the uh, aluminum enclosure but it starts to roll off a little bit here so I'm just taking this notch out as a simple way of not having it bind in the corner so I'm gonna select this whole thing and group this so now I can see that that is what I wanted Okay, I have another piece here that uh, is going to be... I'm going to try printing it with it sticking out, hoping that my Prusa slicer can make a support structure for it. So I've got this in the requisite dimensions. This needs to be the shape it is because it has to be up above the bottom so it clears some components and it can't go too far back or it'll hit the power switch and it can't go too far forward because it'll hit the thumb screw uh, that holds the battery compartment door closed but it does stick out to the side enough that it 
rests up against the nearest XLR connector, thereby keeping this whole thing from sliding too far to the right. It can't slide too far to the left because it'll be up against the internal uh, surface of the uh, aluminum extrusion that the case is made out of. And it sits down on the circuit board on the bottom and this top part here, the thick top, should rest up against the um, the top of the case, the inside of the extruded case. That's the way this works. So I do want this to be part of this rather than gluing it on later. Um, so I need to see if I can uh, attach it where I want it attached. Okay, I line them to touch because they're in even millimeter um, increments of dimensions. I don't have any fractional millimeters on this and the grid is set up to a millimeter grid so I was able to drag them until they snapped onto the grid and then just brought them up until they were both um, on the same grid point and uh, they are aligned on the front but I need to move it back um, by 10 millimeters. So I need to offset this 10 millimeter deep part by 10 millimeters so the front of it is here instead of here. Well, it so happens I've got this on the grid, so. move it there, that moved 10 millimeters, and now I can rotate it around and ah. okay that's correct because this part is 21 millimeters starting from a, a main uh, point on the grid so it should hang over by one millimeter, so that looks good. And I need to now um, offset it in that direction by 10 millimeters. So I click here, I click here, start to move it. And I can go down here and just type 10 millimeters. Boom. And it moved it 10, 10 millimeters. So that's where I want it to be, I think. It's 10 millimeters up. Oh no, that isn't right. It's supposed to be 6 millimeters up and 6 millimeters from the top plus the additional five millimeters. I need to check my math. Okay, I believe this is the correct uh, shape now. With um, this hump on the top and this bulge on the right, that is equivalent to the uh, two foam pads and of course the basic shape here is equivalent to the cardboard box that the original battery holder is made out of. So I'm going to stop with this one part and then make the the back spacer as a separate part which will be glued on later because I think it'll be less trouble to do it that way than to try to build it with the the back spacer as part of this assembly or this printed piece uh, and try to get um, the extensive support structure to come out right in the Prusa slicer. Right now I think I'll print it with this being the bottom therefore there will be a fairly small support structure to to hold this up when this part is printed and I think the Prusa slicer will be able to do that adequately. So let's save this and then um, generate the um, file.
So I'm going to export um, everything in the design. I'm going to generate an STL file. And it downloaded it to somewhere. I don't know where it saved it to. It didn't tell me. Alright, I've made a new design here, or started a new design, and an empty work plane. I'm going to um, roll this back a little bit. About like that. Um, start out with a box is everything I'm designing ends up being and I've decided that this is the sketch up for the about the third version of the back plate it started like this a more complex shape and then I said well it doesn't really need to be that it doesn't need quite as many cutouts so now it's gonna be like this shaded area but then I have to this was done before I made the top taller so now I have to cut out a piece up here so that's this and um, this whole thing is 31 millimeters which is two millimeters less than the 33 millimeter overall height and that's because I need the bottom to be of this back plate to be um, two millimeters up from the bottom so that it clears some surface mount components immediately behind the battery holder but I want the top to align with the back of the holder for alignment purposes when gluing it on. So I've taken care, hopefully I've taken care, adequate care, to uh, make this. So it'll be three pieces. It'll be this block, and then it'll be a negative space block here, and a negative space block there. And I'm going to say that the, the bottom of this is uh, facing me. Is that right? Would that be harder? Yeah, I think I'm going to keep the top uh, of this facing away from me so it's when I roll the um, view down it'll be top up. So I want this to be fairly shallow and uh, let's see here I'll zoom in a little bit. So I want it to be three, three millimeters tall So there's that, and then I want the front to rear to be 31 millimeters and the width to be 21 millimeters. There we go. Roll that down a little bit. That's about right. Now I'm going to, um, and by the way, Tinkercad saves constantly as you're working with it. That's why there's no save tool, only an export tool when you're done with the design. So let's start with the cutout on the left. I'm going to make another box. This one's going to be a negative space box right from the get-go. Obviously this is huge right now. Okay, so I want this to be 22 front to rear. One thing I hate about this is that it insists on having this box there. I guess I can force it to close. So this is going to be 22 and it's going to be 9 wide. And it's going to be, uh, again, three tall. Make sure my dimensions are right. 22 front to rear. That's what I calculated. Nine wide. And three tall. Okay. Should be correct. Now let's... Um, roll this guy up here 
I'm going to do an isometric view so that it doesn't keep making things look like they're different sizes just because I'm dragging them around. And notice that it always keeps it on the Z zero. So I've got that and I've got that. I've got them both selected. I'm going to align the left side and the um, top side. So there's that. And I'm going to get another box and drag it in here. This one's going to be five wide. And uh, two tall. And of course three in this in the Z dimension. Boop. Okay. So I'm gonna drag it over here. And I'm just going to make sure all these things are selected. And I'm going to do an align um, by the top. So now that's aligned to the top and I'm going to align it to the right. Oops, that's not what I wanted. Uh, I think the way to do this one easier is select more <laughs> carefully. Um, I just need to um, drag this guy over until the grid shows since once again I'm using even um, millimeter dimensions so everything will snap to the grid. There we go. And now I'm going to go back to the normal view and Rotate this around, make sure it looks like what I want. And I think it does. Just double check it. Yeah, so this is going to be the cutout for the battery connector to fit through the rear of the box. This is going to be the rib that goes up against the rear. At least on the bottom it's going to contact the rear of the uh, aux power connector. The rest of it's just doesn't need to be here, it's just that it makes it simpler to build. And this will be the cutout because this will be up against the top of the extrusion which curves over a little bit so I could just round it but it's a more complicated curve. I'm not sure exactly what the curve is. It'd be a pain in the butt to measure it so I'm just chunking it out. Keep things simple. All right, so we've got to export this guy now. And once again, I'm going to do an STL. And I'm going to go to my downloads. There's the rear spacer STL. And I'm going to paste it in there. These are the two files that I need. Okay, I'm into my Prusa slicer now and I'm going to get my folder up here and I should just be able to drag these on here so let's drag the battery holder on first and there it is. I can see that it has the uh, notch out in the corner and that it has the protuberance here. Looks like it came through just the way I wanted. Okay, now I do want to change to avoid having this roof here needing a support structure and only have this needing a support structure. I'm going to rotate this guy. Let's see. And it does highlight it. 
if I go over here, that's the one I want. It's going to be rotating it on the x-axis. I can never remember if 90 is counterclockwise or clockwise. I'm going to try 90. Yes, that's what I wanted. So that's placed the way I want it. And this piece here is just fine the way it is. I'll move it over a little bit. Actually, just to make it nicer to look at, I'm going to go the other way. That way I'll have a better view of the um, support structure. I'm selecting um, supports on the build plate only, but that's all it's going to need. And it's 15% infill, but there's going to be very little on here that needs to be infilled. It, this area will be infilled, and probably this thick area will be infilled. I suspect the rest of this being so thin, it's not going to infill at all. Um, so, let's go ahead and slice this and see what happens. Okay, and it has put in a support structure under that guy. And it shows that there's going to be infill in here and infill in here. Um, or that's not necessarily infill, it's the difference between the, the skin and the way it does the rest of it without it necessarily being infill, I believe. So I'm just going to accept what it did here and export the g-code and I'm gonna put it okay save and that should have done it let's see if I actually have a g-code file in there now. It looks like I do. I'm just kind of curious if I go into slice view here, preview. This shows how it's going to build it. As I slide this up here going to start building that structure. Ta-da! So I think it'll be alright. I've copied the G-code file onto the SD card and I'm going to put it in the slot on the Prusa printer and it finds the top of the list, my file, and I'm going to select it and push the button. Checking the file, found it okay. It's going to heat up the hot end and the bed, and then it's going to start printing. It's estimating one hour and 47 minutes. Okay, the uh, hot end is already at temperature, and the bed is cooling down a bit from its overshoot. Imagine it'll start printing within a few seconds. There we go. It's going to do a calibration. of the head. And it's going to print the uh, whatever it's called. 
periphery there which just gets the nozzle and everything flowing smooth before it starts printing So it's done the um, very fine area there for the support. It looks like it's done a uh, support structure inboard of that wall. Maybe to make it a little more resistant to warping or something while it's printing that bulge on the side. That's my best guess. Obviously there's not that much for it to be printing here, that's why it should go pretty quickly. I believe it has finished printing the back plate at this point. It's concentrating on the main holder. Let's see if we can get a peek of that bulge on the side, which does have some infill in it. There we go. About an hour and change to go. Obviously it's finished with the side protrusion and it's just working its way up the walls as a way to go because 9 volt batteries are quite a bit taller than that. Down to the last minute here. And it's done. A couple little spider webs there. I'll just let it cool off a bit. Now, um, only semi-deliberately I'd had half of a thought on this and then got myself sidetracked. This still needs to have a built-up section on it which I uh, did not do but it's okay this way because I'll put it together and then put it in the um, in the uh, power supply 
and make sure that I have the correct dimension for the built up area on there and then I'll regenerate this with the extra bit on it and print that separately it shouldn't take too long and uh, then I'll make the final assembly all right I'm gonna grab the uh, structure here the support structure and uh, try to break it off of there All right, there it is. There's just a little blemishing on the bottom where the support structure attached, but basically it's flat. So... Okay. Let's see how this fits. Now, if I just sit it here, it's low because it's off by two millimeters. Deliberately. Oops. Let's try that again. So it's supposed to join up along the... It's supposed to bridge across like that. Leave that gap at the bottom. I'm a little high there. More like that. Yep. So it'll glue where both fingers are there and then along the edge and along the top here. This should allow enough room for the battery connector to fit through and still have enough clearance here at the bottom to clear the surface mount components on the circuit board. Okay, that's fitting in there good. The protuberance there is clearing the battery connector but going right up against the side of the XLR connector like I intended it to while still having room underneath to not sit right down on top of components on the circuit board. And the back is fitting good. Let's see if I can fit the battery connector through. This is going to take a couple of hands, I think. There it's fitting through. And it does fit through. It just fit precisely like I expected it to. So the only thing I have to do now is tape this together and then take a final measurement for the uh, part that's sticking up here. Okay, putting this back in there and do a final measurement. Looks like 14 millimeters. And that's with this right up against the front. Okay, another test before going any further is to make sure that the battery does fit in there well. Seems to go in there just fine. The uh, vertical dimensions are just barely touching, so it'll hold itself in by friction there. I'd actually expected it to have a little more freedom, but it does slide through very easily, so I don't think I'm going to tweak that. Um, these dimensions are the same as the cardboard. So, um, the cardboard also fit similarly snugly. Okay, now I've got the holder taped in place. <clears throat> with the goal of making sure that it does fit inside uh, let's see it's the other way around isn't it yeah
Well, it looks like this spacer is a little bit too tall to fit in here properly. The um, protuberance should be just a little bit smaller. Yeah, it it's over by... Once I'm actually in here and this is jamming it over, it needs to be a little bit smaller by perhaps two millimeters. Okay, I need to add that extra protuberance on this. So I'm going to drag another box onto here. And it needs to be 12 wide and 8 front to rear. So let's go here. Make that 12 and 8. And it's going to be 15. Um, but I decided that it was actually too much. It's going to be 12 high. Oops. 12. That seems really wrong, doesn't it? <laughs> so it's 12 that way. And 8 that way. And I measured 12 millimeters front to rear. Well, that's what it says it is. Okay. So I'm going to group this. Make sure it's grouped. I'm going to drag this guy onto there. but I have to raise it up three millimeters because that's the thickness of that guy. Now let me move it over here first. You actually have to try dragging it before it gives you the box. So three. Okay. And now I can drag it there. Oops, I'm going too far the other way. So that's 12, 13, 14, 15. That should be about right. Yep, that's the measurement I need. So I'm going to export this again. Um, as an STL file and it saved it there we go and I'll get rid of that superfluous bit there we go so I've kept the old one there's the new one and now I've got to change the amount that this bump sticks out by um, two millimeters. So there it is and I can change this dimension from 10 to 8 and it gets a little bit smaller. One more little refinement. Right down in this area I'm getting really close to a surface mount transistor and the original cardboard holder does ride up on top of that. Uh, I hadn't noticed that when I took the measurements but because this version is a lot more rigid than the cardboard the cardboard just gets an imprint put into it by the transistor. Uh, on here it actually needs to have a cutout. So I'm going to drag another thing over here and 
and uh, get rid of this thing. Um, it needs to be uh, five front to rear. And it needs to be two wide. And it only needs to be too high. How about that? Just a little thing like that. Let's um, drag it up front where it looks a little more realistic. Now this has to start 13 back. So that'll be one, two, three. It looks like it there. And it needs to come over um, actually I'm going to go here first and drag it into that position. And then oops undo what did I just move? There. Nope, I'm moving the wrong thing. Call darn it. Ah. Okay, there's that. I've got it lined up on the 13th grid space. And now if I can keep it in that position while I drag it. One, two, in like that. Okay, it's flush with the bottom, it's flush with the right. It's just going to take a chunk out of that, like that. And I just have to make sure that 13 is what I wrote down, and that's what I wrote down. Okay, that thing sticking out here is a shadow of this. Very nice of them to put a shadow under it. Um, but, um... Just verifying that it's in the right place. I double, triple checked my dimensions, and that should be it. So let's go to export this guy. Oh, well, first I'm going to go into my downloads and change this guy to say OLD. So I won't try doing a funny rename. Go to export, STL, and it should have done it. Let's do a refresh. Yep, there's the new version. Copy that. Go back to my other folder. Rename this one as old. Paste that guy in there. Very good. Okay, back in the Prusa Slicer, I'm going to delete the old version here. Blink. And... Drag the um, rear spacer, the new version, onto here. with the extra spacer on the back. And let's get rid of this guy. And drag the uh, new battery holder 
design onto here and once again it's going to need to be rotated in the X dimension by 90 degrees the cutouts back here yep there it is so why did it make the bed so wide I don't know what that's all about yeah that's just the view I've got yeah so let's drag that a little closer make it a little more economical I still have the supports requested so I'll do a slice and verify that it still has the build structure it looks like it does so I'm going to export my G code I guess I should go back into here and I don't actually need to change this because it's gonna uh, Okay, do that. Export the G code. Same place as before. It's taking the build up to 1 hour and 56 minutes. According to the file name. Export finished. Let's go take a look at the... Um, Let's just take a look at that. Go through the build. Layer by layer. Can I come up here? I'm looking for that notch in the back. There's the notch starting to appear. Then the notch closes up. It's such a small amount, I don't think it'll have any problem with the overhang. And yes, I have the protuberance there, so that all looks good. Go back to the normal view. Close that. Make sure that I do have my... new G-code in place there it is good okay the new g-code files on the SD card plug it in let it read the card and I need to know which one is which the top one should be the newest one let's make sure it says one hour and 56 minutes that's the one I want So it's doing the whole bed heating and everything. I'm not going to uh, video this one in very much detail, I don't think. Off to a good start at least. Definitely printing the uh, protrusion I added for the spacer. So that all looks like it's going well. see that it's done or started to do that little cutout in the corner the uh, notches clearly well focus camera 
doesn't like that at all. Anyway, it's clear that the notch came out pretty good. Another 26 minutes. Counter's showing zero. It is. Okay, there is the new part. That uh, notch came out really nicely. And there is the um, improved version of the back plate. There's it put together but without gluing yet. It's ideally supposed to sit there. Oop, the tape is sagging a little bit so just a little bit back from the front but it can go to the front there's a little bit of wiggle room that's deliberate and now it does sit down flat on the board because that cutout allows it to clear that one transistor down there and it's up against the side of the switch and there's the desired um, clearance along the circuit board Oops. Okay, let's see if it goes in. Yep, there it goes in. Goes all the way in. Fits in like that. I don't have the back on it in there at the moment. But it's fitting in there just precisely the way I wanted it to now. Okay, there is the super glued um, assembly. Okay, final test. This is going to sit down on here. The connector is going to go through the back. Oops. Come out the front. This is just going to sit in there like that. Like that. Battery compartment lines up very nicely with the opening. And another view from the inside. I can prop this up a little bit. There we go. And there's the battery fit inside. And there we are. Modified unit, I think, considerably improved. One other thing I'll say about this is you can use a wide range of um, power supplies for the aux input. I've got this old repurposed um, Netgear AC adapter, which provides, well, it's a universal. Is it universal? No, this one's only for the 120 volt range but it uh, puts out um, 12 volts at 1.5 amps way more than this needs and it was free <laughs> when I retired my old um, wireless router <clears throat> and 
and um, it's got the normal barrel connector. There used to be a lot of different sizes of these and now it seems like they've kind of standardized on one primary size. The uh, outside of the barrel on this one's about five and a half millimeters or about 0.22 inches. And the barrel is about uh, 0.36 inches or roughly nine millimeters. I think 10 millimeters is a fairly standard length. And uh, the hole in the middle, <clears throat> I don't know if I can easily measure that. I think it's about a one millimeter um, diameter pin in there. <clears throat> but this certainly plugs in easily enough. So you don't have to spend a bunch of money. You've probably already got a suitable AC adapter around to run one of these. I've got a mind to make another one of these and send it in to ART as a uh, friendly suggestion on how they might improve their product. So I'm going to make another one of these. a movie and come back and this will be done. And the second one is done. cobweb while well, it's still molten. <laughs> there we go. All wrapped up with instructions.